Hey everybody, this is John Buck back with another array signal processing video. Uh, in this video we're going to talk about the dominant mode rejection beamformer in more detail. This video sort of assumes that you've watched the previous video on proactive adaptive beamforming issues, though I guess not really. Uh, uh, this one isn't as direct, a, that's not as direct a prerequisite, but for the, in the structure of the class, that's the overview of what we'll talk about. And then I'll talk in more detail now about the DMR beamformer. Again, as, as, well, I actually misspoke in the last video, I realized, right after I finished. Uh, Doug Abraham and Norm Owsley proposed this in 1990, not 1980, uh, in an IEEE Oceans paper. A couple important points about the DMR beamformer. The first point is that it is a variant of the MBDR beamformer, of the Minimum Variance Distortion Lace Response. It's a practical variation, uh, but it, it computes its weights essentially the same way as, as some S inverse times the, the desired manifold vector normalized for unity gain. But the, uh, the, what makes it a little different from standard MBDR, or I guess technically it's really a, a variant of the SMI version of MBDR because it's working from a sample covariance matrix. And then the second sort of important point is, is that the way this reduces the degrees of freedom in the problem is it imposes a structure on the sample covariance matrix. The estimated covariance matrix S hat of n, it forces the background to be white. And it does that through analyzing the eigenstructure of the observed sample covariance matrix. So let's see how that works. So as we said in the first video, we assume we observe some capital K snapshots and we average those, the outer product of those snapshots to estimate our sample covariance matrix S hat. So this is our estimate of the spatial covariance matrix. And we're going to assume it has some eigenstructure like this, where, where the capital uh, phi matrix are the eigenvectors. And these are the uh, lambda matrix as is the, is the diagonal matrix of the eigenvalues, the estimated eigenvalues. And again, because the covariance matrix, even the estimated covariance matrix is Hermitian, we know the left and right eigenvectors are the same, and we can write it like this. Or it will also be helpful as we analyze this to think about writing it in the uh, sum form. So if we write it out like that, right, it, mathematically equivalently, we can also write an eigen decomposition if we work this out as the sum as n goes from one to capital N, the, the dimension of the matrix, of the square matrix of the estimated eigenvalue times the outer product of each eigenvector. Right, and we're gonna to assume today that these eigenvalues are ordered too. So if we assume ordered eigenvalues, we say that, that they're ordered from largest to smallest. And of course, because these are all powers in a, in a covariance matrix, they're all non-negative. And so the, the uh, DMR assumes that in practical environments, I usually have some su set of strong interferers and then a bunch of background noise, and that that will be reflected in the eigenvalues here. So I'm going to assume I have capital D large eigenvalues, lambda 1 through lambda D, and we'll see that these represent, these are the, uh, we'll say they're D interferers in our background. So this assumes we've got signal-free, signal-absent data, signal-free data, and it has D interferers in it. And then the second case, we're going to assume the, the rest of the eigenvalues are background noise. So the lambda d plus 1 to lambda n are all background noise eigenvectors. And so this is the part we say, well, we saw when we measured it already, they have a wide spread. They're not nice and flat the way they should be. But when we, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to force it to be flat by averaging all the small ones and replacing them by their average. So just to reinforce that, let me get back the figure and remind you. Matt, we saw this figure in class last week saying, well, this is the truth. If, if we really have you know, background white noise, this was a case with the one loud interferer, and then all these other eigenvalues, where the, you know, this is the index of the eigenvalue, and this is the uh, amplitude. Th this is white noise in the background, where everybody has the same amplitude. But when I estimate it from uh, uh, this case, this, I wrote L here, but in, in our notation for this class, it would be capital K. Uh, I have twice as many snapshots as sensors. I still see, instead of being nice flat along the red line here, I've got a lot of spread of the eigenvalues, and taking the inverse of these small ones is my problem, right? We saw one approach was diagonal loading. The other approach, what DMR says, is why not take all these things, 
compute their average, and then replace all of them by that constant. So I know I'll have something flat that is white noise. So let's see how that would work in equation form. So again, DMR strategy is we're going to create a new covariance matrix. We're going to create, we'll call it S hat sub DMR. This is a, a structured covariance matrix with white noise, with a white, a structured covariance matrix. with white background noise. So the flat power in the background. So to do that, what we're going to do is we'll say my estimate of the noise power will just be that by DMR does implicitly is to average the n minus d smallest eigenvalues, right? We said assuming they're ordered, this would be the sum as little d goes from d plus 1 to n of lambda hat of d. Those are the small eigenvalues divided by uh, 1 over n minus d. So again, this is just the average. Conceptually, this is the average of the n minus d smallest eigenvalues. Okay, and so, and then the, what, what, how that's going to work, let me, uh, we'll, we'll, let me compare the eigen decomposition. So we started with our original sample covariance matrix like this, where we just have the, I'm, I'm separating it into this large and the small ones, but this is just the sum like I showed earlier. And, and what we're going to do for S hat DMR is leave the first term alone. So the the loud eigenvectors, the, the part of the matrix due to the loud eigenvalues, which are the interferers, is unchanged. But the second piece, we, we replace these, these which are varying with n with a constant, which is this estimated noise level, and we pull that out front. And so again, this is for the n minus d smallest eigenvalues. They get replaced by some by their average, so they don't have any variation anymore. So if we compare uh, to what we saw on the the graph a second ago, we've replaced all the small ones that were sloping downhill with their average. Once we've done this, then the way we find our array weights. Well, actually, let me let me draw you a sketch of that just to make it clear. I sort of have a cartoon eigenspectrum like this. So this is showing me, this is n, the dimension, and these are the uh, eigenvalues. And so in this case, I have three loud things. This would be the case where I, I've assumed that d equals three. So everything, this is sort of my dividing line. Everything to this side is loud, and I'm going to say assume these are my loud interferers. Everything over here is the background noise. And so if this is what I got originally for S, for S hat DMR, I would leave those alone, and then I'd go replace all these by, this would be my estimated noise level. So all those eigenvalues above D equals 3 would be a constant, assuming the background is flat, and then I just got these, we know we get these noisy measurements. In fact, we know even more than, than Abraham and Owsley did in 1990 because of random matrix theory tells us uh, that complex Wishart matrices have a particular PDF for their eigenvalues called the Marchenko-Pasteur distribution. Um, and so once we've done this, we, we put this to get back together. We've now got a new matrix. Actually, we don't even have to put it back together because the next thing we want is its inverse. So let's see how we find the weights from this. So now that we've got the co this modified covariance matrix that fits this, this structure, the DMR estimated array weights will be some gain term. This is an alpha type term for DMR. And then instead of the inverting the sample matrix, I invert this constrained or structured covariance matrix and multiply that by V naught. And this is, is actually pretty easily done because we to, the cost of DMR is I have to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So we could, once I have 
uh, the earlier version, I can do it directly. There also turns out to be uh, computational advantages. Uh, this ADMR is, is maybe best found by, we often just, uh, well, let me say what it is first. So ADMR has the same structure we saw earlier with regular DMR, that it's V0 Hermitian times S inverse, but now it's the inverse of the structured DMR matrix times V0. All this to the minus 1. So that when I apply these array weights to the look direction V0, I get a gain of 1. Now what I would generally do in practice is compute this matrix first. Get the, well, compute this first to get the array vector. Right, the, the, the vector in the right direction, but without the right gain, then apply that to V0, and then take the inverse of that and put it and use that to rescale this vector. So I wouldn't necessarily recompute all this directly. I'd recognize that if I compute this first, I have this much here. I can then take this part multiplied by the manifold vector again, Hermitian. That will give me a scalar, because this is a quadratic form. I just take one over that scalar number, and that's the gain I apply to this vector that I've saved somewhere to get my array weight. So I wouldn't recompute this from scratch. I'd do this. It also turns out Abraham and Owsley found some nice computational simplifications that in practice... We just need... Well, V-naught, obviously... And then we need the, the, the strongest eigenvalues and their eigenvectors. But I don't need all of them. So if I have a really big array, say like a 50 element array, and only five or six strong eigenvalues, once I have those, I just need all those. And then I also need the original, well, I need, obviously I need S hat because I had to go find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But there's often, you can save a lot of computation there are clever algorithms for finding only this, the strongest eigenvalues and their eigenvectors rather than finding all of them. And then the, the original Abraham and Owsley paper go through a bunch of linear algebra to show that you can, you can basically find this uh, as uh, V0 uh, minus some over all these loud eigenvalues of a, a we have a different beta output term for each each eigenvalue each eigenvector. I take this projection of the eigenvector onto v naught and use that to scale this. So I'm subtracting out scaled versions of the eigenvector um, from what would be like the CBF, um, and then I have. A DMR scaling factor in front. But so starting from a CBF, subtracting out the uh, the D strongest eigenvectors based on this scaling here where uh, beta sub D out, I should have told you that, is equal to. Uh, this would be the, the INR for the, the D direction uh, times N. So this is the output Wiener gain uh, and INR for the D eigenvalue or the, D uh, the, the interferer part of the D source over plus one. Uh, so so this is uh, easier to compute than finding all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors and inverting the matrix. Uh, but it's, it's mathematically equivalent to what we showed earlier of finding the average, replacing the weak eigenvalues by the average, and then, um, oh, and, and, and to do this you would need, you do need to find the average, but you can do that from the trace of this matrix and these here. All right, so I'll, well, I'm getting probably too far into the details of how you actually compute it in practice. The main big picture idea is that uh, instead of having to estimate everything in all the dimensions, I've reduced the degrees of freedom by saying I'm only going to find the strong interferers and null those out. Infinite random matrix theory turns out tells us that loud, inter loud eigenvalues are, the eigenvectors for loud eigenvalues are easier to find accurately. So I can find those loud interferers I need to get rid of, notch them and push them down, and then essentially what remains can be interpreted as a CBF in the re in the complementary projection space. Let's say get rid of all the loud things. Once you've gotten rid of that problem of the loud things overwhelming your side lobes, in the remaining subspace, run a conventional beamformer because that will get you the best gain against the background white noise. Okay, so that's a, an overview of the DMR beamformer. Uh, when we get 
in class uh, on Monday night, I'll show you some examples, uh, an example of applying it in data like the, the example we, we saw last week uh, for the conventional beamformer, MBDR, and, and sample matrix inversion. I'll show you how the DMR beamformer uh, compares on the same data set. All right, uh, have a good night, and I will see you next time.